Okay, all right. I, I can already see the comments. Everything the live action last Airbender movie got wrong. LOL, how about the whole dying movie? Uh, and you know, maybe that's fair. I mean, like, I don't know, uh, Dev Patel is fine. Uh, the teaser was pretty rad, right? Ah, screw it. Uh, Avatar The Last Airbender is one of the best cartoon series of all time, and this movie sucks. Let's talk about that. Leave him alone! Now let's jump right into this and talk about the opening. In the animated series, it's short, sweet, and to the point, not to mention well-written. While the first episode has a longer and slightly different monologue, it's still engaging and provides enough context for the series to start without huge exposition dumps. The movie somehow managed to suck all life out of that. Instead of having Nicola Peltz perform the original opening monologue, the text was rewritten and lost a lot of its original flow and gravitas. Instead of using this time to set the scene like the animated series, they push half of that information to a conversation between Sokka, Katara, and their grandmother. We'll get into this, uh, this dull bullshit in a minute. But before we get into the storytelling crimes, I need to bring up our slate of heroes. Basically, all of the main characters have the personalities of wet rags. Although I should probably consult with legal to ensure I'm not slandering wet rags. Slander is spoken. In print, it's libel. Thanks, JK. Uh, this isn't a knock on anyone's acting abilities, because the script is so flat, I, I don't know if anyone could have done it justice. Uh, in the movie, the actors feel like they're sitting at a table read and haven't been given any direction on what their characters should actually behave like. In the show, Katara and Sokka are full of life, humor, and heart, while their movie counterparts are walking exposition fountains. Which is sad because we have a decent stable of actors. I mean, heck, Jackson Rathbone was in Twilight and he has... range? The hunting instinct will take over and drive him crazy. Hmm. Well, uh, Nicola Peltz was great in um, uh, uh, tr uh, Transformers Age of Extinction. Moving on. Hey, J.K. Simmons, can you tell me what's wrong with this movie? Hell yeah, man. You might be a defining exploration of toxic masculinity, but uh, your film criticism? On point. Everything is extremely rushed. Of course, when you adapt a TV show with multiple episodes and seasons into a movie, details will have to be changed for the sake of the runtime. The issue with how this was done in The Last Airbender is that the movie jumped from plot point to plot point, and no scene is given time to breathe. Something easily fixed by, like, um, not forcing an entire season of television into an hour and 43 minute runtime. Uh, which, by the way, how is this sucker not even two hours long? I can feel myself physically aging while watching it. Which I did for you, by the way. Yeah, that's right. Specifically, you, James. Next up, the firebending. Oh, the firebending. <laughs> Uh, for whatever reason, they decided that firebenders need a source of fire to firebend. Maybe it was to try to make it seem more fair for the other benders, but it, it kneecaps a pretty important character arc for Zuko in later seasons. Uh, speaking of kneecapping characters, oh, oh, you poor stupid earthbenders. You have earth beneath your feet, you dum-dums. So yeah, uh, basically in the cartoon we get a similar predicament for this group of imprisoned earthbenders, with the notable difference that they are aboard a metal ship miles off the coast, meaning they are far from any of the elements kinda necessary for, you know, earthbending. Or at least, you know, until certain badass characters come along. They wind up using coal to get around this, which at least requires a little imagination on their part. In the film, they're just surrounded by dirt, making them all seem, um... Well, let's be polite and say uneducated. Also idiots. The movie made a series of changes to the physical look of the characters as well. Uh, Aang's tattoos were changed from solid blue arrows to more decorative tattoos, which isn't necessarily a bad change. Heck, I, I, I appreciate that Junji Ito was apparently brought in to consult, but the alterations to the Fire Nation characters were especially egregious. As a father, I can definitively say Zuko's signature scar looks more like a bad diaper rash, and they did away with Fire Nation royalty's top knots. Their hairstyles in the show were extremely important to their character arcs, as they had huge cultural significance. And actually, speaking of uh, cultural stuff, uh, 
look, there, there's no easy way to get around the elephant koi in the room. Uh, why all the whiteys? Like, look, I, I, I don't want to get too deep into this, but in the show, each nation is influenced by different cultures. For example, the Water Tribe draws inspiration from various indigenous cultures across the globe, with the most notable probably being the Inuit people. By casting white actors in the major roles, a significant opportunity for representation is lost, which makes a lot of the cultural nods that they did throw in feel disingenuous. Uh, just look at this scene. We got Sokka, white, Katara, white, Gam Gam over here, white, but then you got all these extras back here, these uh, these little uh, chitlins, this little girl staring directly into my freaking soul, all non-white. Of course, I'm not even going to start going into the issues with uh, John and Jane Smith over here having names like Sokka and Katara, but I will talk smack about how those names are said. Ong flew us to his home. What was even the point of changing the pronunciation of half the names? Katara's right, so fair enough over there, but come on. The Avatar? Ong? Eero? Soka? Agni Key? Come on, guys. Like, I mispronounce a lot of stuff in these videos, but damn. You've got you've you've got literally three whole damn seasons of TV to work with here. And like, look, I, I've heard that M. Knight was a fan of the show. Allegedly. But also like I've seen the movie he made. I just, I, like, th there's a whole studio behind this $150 million movie, and no one said, hey, what if we, like, I don't know, tried to sound like we know what we're talking about? You never earned anything. God, you are a self-righteous prick. When M. Night Shyamalan wrote the script for The Last Airbender, he ignored show, don't tell. Majority of the important information in this movie is given to the audience in boring conversations between a handful of characters or in lieu of something that dynamic, just awful voiceover. We arrived at the Northern Water Tribe. We presented ourselves to the royal court. It's not. Not quite right. This is wild because the world of Avatar is breathtaking and fascinating and like full of cabbage for some reason and was basically given to the filmmakers on a silver platter. The cartoon is a visual masterclass and the film itself, well, I, I, I guess actors like to talk. Uh, a great, um, bad example of this is, well, uh, <laughs> A lot of the, a lot of stuff actually, but uh, on this rewatch, I was especially caught off guard by Zuko asking this small child to explain his backstory to him. Tell me what you know about the prince, the Fire Lord son. He did something wrong. Not only is it adding yet another wooden child actor to the cast, but like, you couldn't just show us the flashback, give Zuko a, a, a nightmare of the event, or 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 heck, maybe. Maybe he could overhear one of his own men describing it and feel some tinge of emasculation. Or, and I, I know this is a crazy thought, but you could just use the extremely emotional explanation from the show, which utilizes Iroh and Zuko's relationship to create a stronger connection while also exploring important backstory. Or not, you know. Feet. Okay. Then we can think about the pretty girls. Got to get in that boring wooden dialogue quota for some reason. Uh, we also see Ozai's face in the movie, whereas in the show, he wasn't clearly seen until the first episode of season three. This shifts him from being a mysterious foreboding figure to just another dude to exposition dump. Although, you know, to be fair, he is played by Cliff Curtis and that dude's a, he's a freaking dreamboat. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but setting aside my love of Cliff Curtis-based scrapbooking, uh, in the film it doesn't even seem like M. Night Shyamalan knows this is the direction he's going. This scene clearly shows Ozai's face, while in this later one he's treated with the same mystery as the show. Unrelated, but do they sell these giant spike balls at Pier 1? That, that, thing is, that thing is sick. Uh, in the show, Aang ran away from the Air Temple because he was overwhelmed at the prospect of being the Avatar, uh, especially because he overheard the monks saying that he would be taken away from Monk Yatso, uh, who was his mentor and father figure. The dramatic irony of that is that we the viewers find out that Gyatso wouldn't have allowed that. In the movie, Aang says that he ran away because he was told he couldn't have a family, which is so strange because that is never mentioned in the show. Legend of Korra came out a few years after this movie, so it hadn't yet been confirmed that Aang had children. But even in the show, Avatar Roku has a family and is even Zuko's great-grandfather. That dude pulled. 
Another change is that in the movie, Aang doesn't use water bending until the end. Zhao even points it out when he has Aang captive. In the show, however, Aang is a naturally gifted waterbender and even runs into conflict with Katara in episode 9 because she gets jealous of how easily it comes to him. Okay, so uh, I could honestly just, I could keep going scene by scene for several hours, but I'm pretty sure this is supposed to be like an eight minute video. Uh, so, Zhao. Uh, dude is totally different in the movie. In the show, he's a formidable foe who becomes progressively more unhinged as book one carries on. In the movie, he's just Ozai's lapdog, I guess, and seems incapable of thinking for himself. Vis-a-vis, -vis, less interesting character. Uh, he also somehow immediately knows that the blue spirit is Zuko, whereas in the show, it's a big dramatic moment when he has that realization. Also, what's up with this scene? You can give your life back for the spirits. No, that's not. That's not how that hap that's not ha that's not how any of this is supposed to happen. Sorry guys, hate to put you through this. Well, that's a penis. <laughs>